Hello, and welcome to Five Things to Know When Starting Out with 3D in Qt6. I'm James Turner, one of the software developers at KDAB who work extensively with 3D applications on a whole range of platforms. Today, we'd like to look at some of the things you will encounter when considering adding 3D content to your Qt6 application. The first thing that we want to consider is what you actually want to see in 3D. Now, a good question is, given the rich 2D and indeed 2.5D options available from Qt Quick out of the box, why do we actually want to add 3D at all? And of course, the reason is that humans exist in a 3D world and our brains are very adept at processing spatial information and organizing large quantities of information when it's presented in a 3D way. But in the end, we are showing our content on a 2D screen. So there's a real trade-off there of saying, do we actually gain any value from adding 3D? And hopefully we do. Of course, there are also uh, marketing reasons and similar why adding 3D content might be desirable to an application. Let's look at some examples of 3D content that we encounter commonly in our work at KDAB. The first one we want to consider is around automated driver awareness and self-driving vehicles, as shown here. It's very common in a modern automated driving scenario for the vehicle to have a whole range of data inputs from LiDAR, cameras, obviously GPS, and also navigation sources. All this information needs to be integrated, potentially processed by vision systems, and then displayed to the user so they can understand what decisions the car is making or they should be making in the near future. This can include nearby vehicles, lane guidance, real-time hazard information, passing points of interest, and more. And it's almost taken for granted these days that this will be given in a rich 3D view, since that's what all the popular car manufacturers are doing. The next very common area, given Cute's long history in the scientific engineering space, is visualization of large scientific workflows. For example, CAD analysis of buildings or vehicles, geographic surveying of underground areas or features, such as in archaeology, and so forth. This typically involves very large amounts of data, which might be individually quite simple, but have millions or tens of millions of data points being collected over potentially large distances or over very small resolutions, depending on what kind of device produces the data. And again, 3D is valuable to analyze the data, inspect from different directions, maybe make some analysis or thresholding and, and see what's being actually recorded. The third area that's commonly encountered with Qt is medical devices. This typically involves volume data corrected from an MRI scanner or a CT scanner, and then some combination of additional non-volume data showing perhaps surgical tools or where a treatment or fixture or prosthesis might be included in, into a patient. These can be used by clinicians, but also shown to patients in clinical settings these days, and of course need to have a very high standard of accuracy, fidelity, and performance. Anything less would be unacceptable in the medical market. The final area is industrial and appliance controls. This is on large systems such as a tipper truck or a welding machine or maybe an industrial printer, where there's a large array of configuration, servicing, maintenance and faulting options, where a 3D representation of the device can be invaluable in helping a novice user find the correct area to maybe add some new ink or monitor the level of a setting or simply see what the device is about to do when a button is pressed. For example, extending some support legs on a crane or a tipper truck. This can be shown visually before the action is confirmed to happen in the real world, potentially causing some you know, problems or harm. Of course, there's many other kinds of 3D content you might be showing in a good application, but these kind of areas cover the broad topics we see. The second large thing to consider is where your content is coming from, especially if it was produced in advance or is loaded at runtime. Pre-authored content is very common in the 3D space, especially in the entertainment world of movies and games and so forth, where large groups of 3D designers who've studied that skill professionally for multiple years use large and very expensive tooling to produce very complex 3D content. Uh, this is exactly where most of the time and money goes in producing modern games and digital movies. This work is extremely skilled and it's different from code development. And typically the result is very uh, rich assets, which are produced in some kind of interchange format, which can then be loaded by Qt. 
and compared to the 2D world where a file might contain a single image or perhaps a collection of images, it's common for this content in a single file to contain animations, behaviors, perhaps an entire scene of considerable complexity. And therefore when loaded, there's more possibilities in terms of selecting particular pieces or finding animations by name and triggering them. In contrast, runtime content is typically defined by real-time data sources. Qt applications being based partly in C++ are excellent at integrating third-party libraries, giving GPS data, navigation, and many other kinds of real-time data source. And for many applications we've just discussed, it's important to be able to define positions of models, colors, textures, shapes of things based on that real-time data, therefore done primarily by code. But of course, to get the best results, we probably want to combine that runtime defined data with some pre-authored models, materials, and so forth. So we have a visually pleasing view that's based on our runtime data that we're loading. The third thing we want to consider is that there is no U in Qt, but there could be depending on how you spell it. What am I talking about here? Well, when you discuss 3D content platforms, and especially portable 3D content platforms, you immediately start to consider two very obvious uh, contenders in that market. There are complete cross-platform solutions for 3D, which define editors for individual meshes, for complete scenes, for scripting events and behaviors, and then executing those on runtime in a whole range of different devices, mobile phones, desktops, gaming consoles, and the web. And the two main contenders in this space are Unity and Unreal. Uh, both of them start with letter U, hence the slightly dumb choice for this slide. These will let you build a complete scripted solution for essentially a game or something like a game that's primarily 3D content, perhaps with 2D elements. Uh, and they're completely analogous to the Macromedia Flash in the days that it existed. So there's a large complex authoring tool you spend as a designer or artist hours and hours and weeks and months working with that tool. At the end of that, you hit export and export a large complex bundle of as assets in a proprietary format. And then you load that into a runtime which deploys it across different target platforms, hopefully running the same everywhere. If you want to create a portable game, these are absolutely the way to go in the current era, but they're very challenging to use inside a Qt application. They themselves do most of the things that Qt does. They include web browsers, script runtimes, property systems, file loaders, and more. So it's very hard to make something as large as Unity or Unreal coexist nicely as a library inside Qt. There are other solutions in this space, including an existing solution available inside Qt, that we'll talk about in a future video. The fourth thing that we need to consider is that in the modern era of computer graphics, hardware abstractions matter. Uh, any sweet solution we wish to use inside Qt must interoperate with the RHI layer that's in Qt 6. RHI stands for the Rendering Hardware Interface. This is because there's no single graphics API that we can use everywhere because of different choices made by the hardware vendors. To get good performance, energy efficiency, and correct rendering across the different platforms, especially the iOS platforms and Microsoft platforms, we have to use an abstraction over the different APIs. So any solution we want to consider for 3D should integrate with RHI or something like it. We're going to talk about this in more detail in a follow-up video because it's a very complex topic. Another area that's important is we want to have a familiar Qt API, ideally. This isn't always possible, but ideally we want something that has properties, integrates with QML, and indeed with our existing QML files, and also allows loading runtime data from C++ inputs and from external libraries, since that's, of course, what Qt is good for. And it should also be straightforward to combine our 3D content with 2D content, which brings us to our fifth point. 3D is only half the story. Maybe less, maybe more. If your application is entirely 3D, you might be making some different choices. If your application is entirely 3D, you're probably making a game, which would go back and consider Unity or Unreal. Uh, but if you have an existing application you're adding 3D content to, or you have an application which has some 3D content and 2D screens, you need to have good coexistence with your 2D and 3D content. We don't want to compromise all the excellent features of Qt Quick, because we added in 3D, either in terms of what we can and can't do, or in terms of performance and energy efficiency. Of course, the 3D screens may completely dominate your development time since Qt Quick is very straightforward to produce 2D content in. But in terms of what the user sees, if the 3D content is optional, something they never use, they don't want their whole application to be 10 times bigger or take 10 times as long to start up 
because in one screen there's some 3D content they never care about. So we want to preserve our 2D performance and features while maybe optionally enabling 3D or having 3D use in certain areas. More than that, we might want to have a single 3D viewport on one screen or multiple 3D viewports coexisting. We might also want 2D content to exist on 3D surfaces and we might want traditional cute quick effects such as animations or graphics effects to be overlaid on top of 2D viewports, underneath them, around them and so forth. If we make the right choices, all of the things can work with good performance, but it's very easy to compromise on some of them, and sometimes you simply have to to get good performance on particular hardware platforms. But ideally, they can all work. In this video, we've talked on various points you may encounter in Qt6. As you can probably tell, each of them actually has more detail we could con consider. So in future videos, we're going to dive into several of these and look in more detail. Especially, we're going to talk about the existing solutions that ship as part of Qt6 for 3D, what they can do, and what the trade-offs are within them. We're also going to look at, in a deep dive, how the RHI layer and hardware APIs interact, and how this might affect your choices, including a different 3D engine, for example, a third-party one inside Qt6. And finally, we're going to look at what the options are for end-to-end -end content tooling in Qt6. In other words, creating scenes or assets with behaviors, animations in some kind of complex editor and importing and running those inside a Qt6 application. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to going into these topics with you in future videos.